started? Yes, please. Oh, okay. So um, welcome everyone to the CDIP seminar series. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my very good friend, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne is uh, originally from New Jersey, uh, where she did her undergraduate at, at Rutgers University. Uh, she then did her PhD at Johns Hopkins with Michael Eidenen, who is well known for discovering the, the membranes or fluid structures. Uh, she then went on and uh, to a warmer climate in La Jolla, California, where she uh, uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship at UC San Diego with Ed Dennis, who is considered a guru of phospholipases. Um, it turns out that I was a postdoc for a washer at the same time, and we, we were working on the same enzyme. Unlike me, she went on to do other things. Um, so after her uh, postdoc fellowship, she joined VCU in Richmond, and she rose up the ranks to full professor. And while she maintained an interest in basic research, she built an outstanding track record in teaching at the undergraduate graduate and medical school levels and earning uh, oogles of awards for the for her lecturing. Also during this time she devoted a lot of her a lot of her time to diversity issues and has tremendous ongoing success with getting grant awards in these areas like a an NIDDK step up award for exploring biomedical research opportunities and an NIGMS award for minority access to research careers and a recent NSF uh, LSAM Bridges to the Doctor Program Award. She eventually moved to UGA in, uh, in Athens in uh, 2015 to become Dean of the Graduate School there. And recently in 2019, she took on the same uh, but a more expansive position at UNC. She travels uh, quite a bit. And at one time it was like, it was Monday, she was in Chicago. It was Tuesday, she was in uh, Boise. Uh, she delivers uh, lectures on diversity and minority education all over the place. And we're very happy to have her talk to us today about these issues. Um, so as we uh, mentioned to Suzanne and uh, she's in the race to answer any questions during the talk or, or put them in chat uh, and you can ask them yourself afterwards or I'll read them out. Also, she's happy to answer questions afterwards uh, if you want to email her or anything like that. So, uh, Suzanne, welcome. Thank you for doing this. And uh, you are free to share your screen now, I guess. There you go. Oh, mute. Okay, you think I'd know all this by now. Well, thank you, Sasanga, for that um, that lovely introduction. I was almost afraid of what you would say, so that was very, that was very nice. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today about um, issues that are really important to me. Um, and as Sasanga said, issues that have really occupied the second half of my career. Um, I hope I can provide you with some insights into things that have worked for me or have worked for um, other folks that I know. And, um, you know, every institution is different. Every institution has its own culture and its own challenges. And so some of this may be applicable and some of it may be completely inapplicable, but I hope we can have a nice conversation today as well. Um, I'm going to start by showing you some data because I know, like me, you all are scientists and data uh, really resonates with you. And the data I'll show to you come from um, the most recently released um, survey of enrollment by the Council of Graduate Schools. Council of Graduate Schools does these uh, surveys every year. The most recent data available are for 2019. Um, the fall 2020 data are being collected right now. In fact, I think the deadline is sometime this week. Um, but this is just to show you where the demographics of our graduate student population across all the disciplines are or were in the fall of 20, uh, 2019. And as you can probably imagine, this, um, this is uh, segregated by, um, by race and ethnicity, um, probably an unfortunate word I chose there, segregated. It's uh, categorized by race and ethnicity. And you can probably guess what the big green piece is, um, that, that's students who identify as white. And um, the various um, minority groups are here in the other colors, um, in particular, bl Black or African American is in gold, um, and the blue here is, is Hispanic. Um, the gray is Asian. And then the other minority groups, of course, are represented at much smaller levels. Um, the reason I want to show you these data is to kind of give you a snapshot of where we are, but I also want to give you a snapshot of where graduate education is going. 
So if you look on the right hand side, now instead of just looking at the 2019 data, we're looking at the change in total enrollment across the decade from 2009 to 2019. So the taller the bar, the, um, the, the larger the increase in total enrollment. And then of course, if the bar is going in the other direction, that means there's been a reduction in enrollment. And there's been an enormous increase in um, enrollment of Hispanic students in particular. But note that both Asian and, and African-American students are up as well. One thing I'll point out to you is that um, the growth in enrollment, there is negative growth in enrollment of white students. And again, that gives you a snapshot of where, um, where we're going. Um, the, the future of graduate education really rests in recruiting students from these underrepresented groups, um, currently underrepresented groups. Um, another way to look at this sort of, these sort of data is to look at, rather than total enrollment, to look at new enrollment or first time enrollment. And that's what's shown on this slide. So uh, again, these are 2019 data. The left-hand side is showing you the snapshot in 2019. And again, on the right-hand side, I've got that um, percent change between 2009 and 2019. And, and again, you can see that our first time enrollments were largely white students in, in the fall of 2019. But look at the size of the bar here for, for Hispanic students, for African-Americans and for Asians. A again, what these data are telling us is the, the future of graduate education really rests in ensuring that we can recruit students from these um, currently underrepresented groups. Of course, I know that you all are, are biomedical, so, uh, so I want to get the data um, parsed out in a, a little more um, granular fashion. And we'll look at some of these data in terms of enrollments in particular disciplines on the next couple of slides. So this, these again are data from the um, Council of Graduate Schools. Again, we're looking at the percentage change in enrollment over the decade from 2009 to 2019. And I know the text is really hard to read down here at the bottom, but I'll tell you the two tallest bars here on the slide the blue one here is students enrolled in the health sciences, so that would be disciplines like yours. And there's also been a huge increase in mathematics and computer science, as you can probably imagine. And whether you look at total enrollment of graduate students, on the, as you see on the left, or new enrollment, that's that first time enrollment that I showed you on the previous slide, that's what I have here on the right, um, the same holds true. There's been an enormous increase in interest in, in your discipline, uh, as well as in math and computer sciences. And of course that prompts the question, um, are we seeing that same burst of interest in students from underrepresented groups? And you can probably guess, I wouldn't be showing you these data if that weren't the case. So again, this is enrollment by field. In this case, we're just looking at the two fields. The blue is health sciences, the orange is math and computer science. And again, we're looking at um, the change in enrollment over the decade from 2009 to 2019. As you can see across all the racial groups, there's been an increase in, in there's been increased interest in health sciences and math and computer science. But again, look at the size of the increase in um, among Hispanic students, Asian students, and African American students. So, long story short, um, the future of not just graduate education in general, but of your field and your fields in particular, really is um, going to be related to our ability to attract and ultimately retain students from currently underrepresented groups. And so before I tell you about um, some of the things that, that, that we've done and um, things I've seen in terms of um, attracting and retaining students in those groups, I thought, I thought I'd throw a question out to you and ask you, what strategies do you currently use to recruit students from underrepresented groups? So if anybody wants to unmute and just throw out some ideas, I'd love to hear them. So you don't use any strategies, they just appear? Um, we have a merit fellowship program here at UAB and we work with um, historically HBCU um, campuses. Um, it's a chance for the fellows who are in the program to get teaching experience and we go and and teach at these campuses and um, try to recruit via that way. I've been involved with for a number of years, um, the Field of Dreams Math Conference, which is specifically, uh, it's the, the FGAP mentoring. So the facilitated graduate application process for underrepresented um, black, Hispanic, math and science or math and statistics students. And that's been really beneficial for, for our program. I think they're now up to 600 students mm -hmm. In, in the past 10 years that have applied to graduate school through that program. That's fantastic. Hi, Suzanne, that's Lori. Um, we, we have several NIH funded programs that target underrepresented students and students with disabilities uh, at, the, at the PhD level. I'm PI of one of those, Lisa Schubert, I think is on the call, she can talk about merit. 
Um, but there's a bunch of summer programs too that are funded NSF, NIH that target underrepresented minorities, and then our relationships with our local HBCUs uh, to attract students. So there's, there's several things. School of Engineering also um, has summer programs for Birmingham City Schools. Those, those are all great strategies, and, and, and some of them are, are strategies that I've seen work really well, too. The, those summer research programs are, are kind of the, the entree, and, and, and I, I would remind you that um, there's the potential of not just site programs where you, you recruit a whole group of students, but if you have a federal grant, um, whether it's from the NIH, NSF, um, you know, EPA, uh, you can ask for a supplement to support an underrepresented student in your um, in your lab, and, and not just during the summer. You can support underrepresented students even during the academic year, um, and those are great ways to get students to take a look at your university and 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 think about applying and ultimately going to graduate school there. I, I'll tell you, I've been at multiple universities in the South. In fact, all my academic career has been at universities in the South. And um, when you get outside the South, we really do suffer from the history, um, particularly for African American students in the South. And so having the opportunity to spend time on your campus, spend time in your city too, um, can make a huge difference when it comes to a student deciding whether they want to come to your, um, your university. And I'd argue, you know, that it, this being Black History Month, we've certainly heard um, reminders about the church bombing in Birmingham that may feel like it's a long time ago to you, but for an African-American student from New Jersey, like I was, um, the idea of going to Birmingham, Alabama would have been, oh, you know, so, so it's, it's a good way to, to give students a, a, a new and more objective um, um, impression of your, your town and your university. Um, you, I believe you all also have a PrEP program. We do. Which PrEP is the most outstanding program um, in the, the arsenal of programs that uh, NIH has in its pipeline portfolio. I was on a call earlier today and heard the statistic that 75% 70, of students who go through PrEP programs enter PhD programs. So of, of all the programs that um, that the NIGMS supports, MARC, IMSD, you name it, the PrEP is the most successful one. And that these post back programs are another great way to recruit um, underrepresented students. Um, of course, they're the signature research fairs. Um, you know, the, the ones that, that work have worked well best for me in the past have been Abercams and SACNIS. Um, SACNIS is the Society for um, uh, it's advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in science. And Abercams is the annual biomedical research conference for minority students. If, if you've not been to these conferences, they're just, they're just wonderful. Um, it's a great opportunity for students to present their work. Um, there's a huge recruiting fair and everybody who's anybody is there. Um, and then there's also an opportunity to you know, engage students one-on-one -on -one in a way that again, can get them excited about your, um, your program. Uh, I can tell you having had, um, um, uh, booths at, at Abercams, when students walk up to your booth, they ask you two questions. Number one, do you have summer programs? And number two, do you have a, um, an admissions fee waiver? And, um, and those are two big barriers to, to entry that you might want to think about if you're going to engage students from underrepresented groups. So many of our underrepresented students do one of these pipeline programs or a summer program of some sort. So if you've got application fee waivers for students who come from those programs, um, you know, I don't have to pay a fee. I'm more likely to think about uh, applying to your school. Same thing's true of the GRE. You know, more and more folks are opting out of the GRE. I don't know if you all have done that yet. Yeah, um, we opted out uh, of the GRE in 2016. Cool. We, we're we're behind you. Um, we're doing a pilot right now to decide whether we want to opt out of the GRE. Um, you know, the long and the short of it is, for many of our disciplines, if you know our competitors have all opted out, then we're at a competitive disadvantage if we don't. Um, this next bullet, I want to show you a little more data. Um, this uh, idea of competitive offer packages, and you know, I mean, I'm sure you've you've heard, um, and your your faculty are probably talking about the idea that, you know, to be competitive, you have to provide students with stipend and with um, you know, tuition support and and uh, health insurance and and the like. But I just want to give you a snapshot of why that's that's so important, especially for underrepresented students. And I'll show you that on the next slide. These are data from the most recent survey of earned doctorates. It's 2018 data. And what you're looking at is the percentage of doctoral recipients in that year who had more than $10,000 of undergraduate debt. And so I think the text is, is large enough this time that you can see the different racial and ethnic, ethnic groups along the, um, the axis here. And the tallest one is, is African-American. And so you can see more than 50% of your African-American um, doctoral recipients likely graduated from, um, from graduate school with more than $10,000 of undergraduate debt. 
And that, of course, suggests, they, suggests that they had more debt when they started graduate school. And so when they're thinking about offers, they're thinking about those offers, not just in terms of what do I need to live in Birmingham, but also what do I need to live in Birmingham and continue to pay off any loans. And of course, some of those loans they can defer during graduate school, but there's no guarantee that they can defer them all. So going back, um, you know, the, the last button um, bullet here is what I want to spend the bulk of my time talking about. And it's the idea of how you retain underrepresented graduate students. And the reason I say that retention and satisfaction of current underrepresented graduate students is a recruiting tool is because students talk to each other um, and they talk to friends and they talk to family. And, and if your institution gets a reputation for having a, a welcoming um, a culture, a culture that values diversity, a culture that recognizes difference and thinks that difference is a positive rather than just sweeping distance difference under the rug, then, um, then students are going to be more likely to apply to and ultimately accept your offer if they're admitted to your graduate programs. So again, I want to spend time talking about um, retention uh, for the, the remainder of, of my time with you, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have or any thoughts you want to share on recruitment strategies. I have a question that I've sort of been working with. So Stacy Cofield, um, I knew you from VCU. That's where I was in the in the '90s, but I was a grad student, so wow. <laughs> over oh, there. Um, I'm the associate dean for recruitment, retention, diversity for the graduate school, and one of the things that I'm sort of thinking about is particularly for Hispanic Latino when there is not a local population, even really regional, to draw from. Um, what how how what's the best way to really extend that reach and part of it comes into retention um, yeah. to get applicants to come to Alabama yeah that, that that's a really hard one Stacy I, I wish I had a simple answer for you there I, I think I think the, the key there is to make it clear that despite the fact that there there's not a large community that you, that the culture is still one that can be embraced and that there um, that the existing community will not reject the student because of the culture. Um, my guess is there may be more of that community in, in your um, in Birmingham than you know of. And so I, I would argue you might want to reach out to the handful of, um, of Hispanic faculty, um, staff and students that are at, at UAB to see if you can get a sense of what um, what's going on in the community and how you might connect students to the community. Fantastic. Thank you. I had a quick question. Uh, this is Karen Gamble. Um, I, I was really struck by your loan data that you just showed. Do you know if the NIH is interested in extending the loan repayment program to include undergraduate uh, debt to be paid off if they enter a PhD program for minorities specifically? Yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And um, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Um, I actually don't know a lot about how the LRP program works and that that's a flaw. I, I need to figure that out. It's a very good question though. So, so let, let's talk a little bit about strategies to retain students from underrepresented groups. And I'm posing this as a, um, you know, as a question to you here, but I, I'm gonna go through some strategies and I hope as I do, we can, we can debrief on them a bit. So, so I'll start by kind of outing my current institution and telling you that after, um, after the events of last summer, um, our, the black graduate students here at Carolina were, were, were very upset. They, they've been upset for a while. And we've, our problems here at Carolina have been all over the Chronicle and other major news sources. So I'm sure you probably heard about them. But, um, but our black graduate students wanted to talk, quite frankly. And so they had some conversations last summer amongst themselves and with some facilitation from um, folks here in the graduate school. But they really wanted to talk to, to university leadership. And so last fall, um, we arranged a, a, a time for them to meet with the chancellor of our university, um, our provost, um, our um, interim um, chief diversity officer and, and myself. And um, in the course of that conversation, they raised a number of concerns and some of those concerns are shown on the slide. Um, like I say, we're a, a large uh, university in the South with a big biomedical footprint. Um, we look a lot like UAB. And so I would not be surprised if your students at UAB your black graduate students at UAB would express similar concerns if you had a conversation with them, and, and, and maybe you have. But you know, the, some of these, I guess, are obvious. You would have expected the students would bring up issues of, of funding. You might expect they would bring up issues related to our anti-racism um, efforts or lack thereof. Um, 
you, the meeting space one is is one of um, you know we have space for for black students at Carolina, but there's no space designated for black graduate students in particular, and graduate students don't necessarily want to hang around with the undergraduates that they serve as TAs for. Um, but but it, go, it went beyond kind of the obvious and and some of the things I was surprised to hear them talk about faculty diversity, for example, and the dearth of role models. Um, they also recognized that the, the limited number of black faculty who are here on campus in their disciplines have an enormous burden in that they're not only doing the things that all faculty members do, trying to keep their grants going and trying to, you know, to, to get good teaching and, you know, doing the, the usual fac um, faculty service, but they're also serving as, as role models and mentors and coaches for, um, for underrepresented graduate students and in a, dis in a disproportionate way compared to their majority peers. Um, and, and then finally, the students brought up the issue of what I'm going to call problematic faculty. And I'll come back to that later on in my talk when we talk about mentoring. So this is just a snapshot of the kinds of concerns that Black graduate students um, had here on this campus. Um, again, I, I would not be surprised if students on your campus have similar concerns. And I'm going to use this as a launching point to talk about uh, retention. And I'll start by telling you that we have a really cool um, mechanism here at, at Carolina. Um, it precedes me. I can't take any credit for this whatsoever. It's called Diversity and Student Success, or DSS. Um, DSS is a unit within the graduate school. Um, it's, it's a relatively small unit. There are only two or three staff members there and a, a bunch of, of, of graduate assistants who are just incredibly fired up. But they provide programming that focuses on um, the recruitment the retention of and retention of graduate students, and they also do some campus centered things that essentially help to elevate some of the issues and challenges that our underrepresented graduate students face here at Carolina. On the recruitment side, um, we have a summer undergraduate pipeline program and it's basically a collection of REUs from all around the, the university. There are probably like 15 or 20 of them. And, and the graduate school um, provides some programming during the summer that helps students to understand the um, the strategies one can use to identify a graduate program, um, how to put a graduate um, school application together, and, and what to expect once you get into graduate school. Um, I want to focus our time today on these retention and completion efforts, and in particular, I want to talk about some of the commu community building efforts that um, are we run through the, the DSS program. Um, I think this is really the cornerstone of, of what DSS does. Many of our underrepresented graduate students um, are the only one in their graduate programs. And they're, in a few cases, they're the first one of their, whatever their identity is, is in their graduate program. And so um, just as was brought up a couple of minutes ago by Stacy, they're, they're looking for community. They're looking for a place where they can gather with folks who, who identify in the same way they do, even if they're not in the same discipline. And so DSS builds that home for them through these um, five initiatives that you see on this slide. Um, we have one for LBG, LGBTQ students called QGAPs. There's one for military aff affiliated graduate students called MAGs, really important in this, this state because we have a huge military presence. We have one for racial and ethnic minority students called IME or the Initiative for Minority Excellence. For international students, there's an initiative called Global Grads. And then up here at the top is a, a really important initiative for us. It's called the Carolina Graduate Students First, Graduate Student Firsts. And it's specifically for first generation graduate students, not first generation college students, but students who are the first in their generation to go to graduate, I'm sorry, first in their families to go to graduate school. And so I wanna tell you a little bit more about first, just to, just to give you one example of the, these community building efforts and, and the kinds of things we're doing. But I also wanna show you a little more data to give you a sense of why um, serving first-generation students is so important in the first place. So these are data that come from the Survey of Earned Doctorates again, um, again, the 2018 data set. And, and they're basically looking at the parents' education levels for, um, for, graduate, for, for individuals who earned their doctorates in 2018. And what you see along the bottom of each one of these, these figures are different levels of education with high school or left at the far high school or less at the far left and research doctoral degree at the far right. And then the blue is the father and, and, the, and the, the orange is the mother. And I've got the overall data here on the, um, the top left and the other, the other um, panels are showing you um, the data for uh, broken out by different disciplines. 
I'm not going to go through this any, in any detail. The long and the short of it, as you can probably imagine, is most of our graduate students overall, their, their parents don't have research doctoral degrees. You know, they're, they're going through this for the first time, and, and, and they're essentially going through it on their own because uh, mom and dad don't necessarily understand what they're going through. What I really want to get to are the data on the next two slides because I want to get back to um, underrepresented students. And so now we're looking specifically at the, the mother's education for doctoral, doctoral recipients in 2018. And each one of these pie charts, um, the sectors are showing you the different levels of, of um, education attainment. And I'll tell you the dark blue is high school or less. And so if you just focus on that, that dark blue sector and compare it in Hispanic and African-American students on the left versus Asian and white students on the right, you can see that it's much larger for the Hispanic and African-American students. And what that means, of course, is that your Hispanic and African American students are less likely to know the ins and outs of graduate education. They're much less likely to know that you should that you should expect to have support for graduate education, that you don't have to pay to go to graduate school. They're much less likely to understand why it's so important to focus on the science, on the research. And um, you, you have to get good grades, but ultimately you have to do um, well in the lab. And so there's, a, there's an education piece, there's a culture piece here that our underrepresented students are much less likely to have access to before they come to graduate school than are our majority students. And on the next slide, I'll just show you the data for fathers because they're even more dramatic. You know, more of the fathers actually do attain college and ultimately um, pr uh, professional and research doctoral degrees for Asian and um, white students. But again, we see that disparity for Hispanic and African-American students. So recognizing this, the DSS team has developed a, a variety of strategies to engage first generation students here at Carolina. And, and these um, activities start with orientation. They start at the very beginning, identifying these students as being unique, as having a unique lived experience, and as needing some additional support to ensure that they can enjoy the same success in graduate school as do our students whose parents have PhDs. And so what you see on this, this slide is just a list of some of the activities that our, our um, DSS team has uh, organized for graduate student firsts. And just to point out a couple of them that may be of interest, this understanding funding basics, for example, our, our um, first generation students don't necessarily know you can apply for fellowships. They don't necessarily know how important it is to do that. The idea of tapping into and creating in, informal support networks our first generation students come to graduate school and sometimes they think it's just an extension of undergraduate school. And so again, they need that, that sort of support. And I'll also point out, we have these first gen Fridays. Um, you know, a lot of this is, uh, is very much um, formal programming. It's workshops and it's um, panel discussions. First gen Fridays is just a time to let it all hang out. Just kind of take a, a breather hugely, hugely popular with our first gen students. And it really does give them a chance to let their hair down and you know, just kind of be who they are in a place where they feel safe and where they feel valued. So we're very proud to be a first forward advisory institution um, for um, first generation students. We take this work very, very seriously. And, it, and it's one of the things that's gotten the DSS um, group um, a number of awards over the years. So um, what, I, I want to move into talking about graduate student wellness, and I'll have, I'll have quite a number of slides here. And, and obviously, wellness is important for all our students, not just for underrepresented students. But, um, but there's, no, there's no question that, that, that our underrepresented students often have more challenges than our, our, our majority students do. And particularly in, in COVID times, there, there's evidence, I think I heard this morning, that something like a third of graduate students when surveyed last fall showed um, signs of, of PTSD. And that pre the prevalence of PTSD, of signs of PTSD was much, much larger in underrepresented students than it was in students from majority groups. So, um, so these eight dimensions of wellness are, um, are something we, we all need to, be, need to pay attention to. And um, we've been trying to build in more um, wellness type programming for students um, in, in light of all this. Um, some of that program is directed at, at all graduate students and open to all graduate students. But we found that um, leveraging things like our IME initiative, the QGAPS initiative, the FIRST initiative has been really um, effective for us because it gives us, us the opportunity to offer wellness programming to our underrepresented students. And again, that safe, protected environment where they can be authentic and be themselves. Um, we work with the, uh, the Wellness Center here at the, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. It's, it's a part of student affairs. Um, you know, like 
every institution student affairs here tends to focus on undergraduates, but we're really lucky that we have a point person in student wellness who specifically works with um, with graduate students. And it's been just a tremendous resource for us. And what you see here is something I, I pulled off the website of, of the Carolina Wellness um, Office of Student Wellness, just to give you a sense of the, the guiding values of that office. Um, I won't go through this in any detail. I just wanted you to see it. Um, what, what I will do though, is focus on some of the things that um, wellness has been providing to graduate students. So I'll talk about them in, in, in three categories, really. Um, the first is, is the community building piece. And, and that's something we actually do internally through our, the initiatives I showed you, the IME and the firsts and the mags that uh, um, you saw a couple slides ago. Um, that community building comes in the, in the form of things like First Gen Fridays, we've got a Writing Monday, you know, a chance for these students to come together uh, again in, in a safe space. And every month we have a targeted newsletter that goes out to inform the students of the opportunities that will be available that, that, that upcoming month. Um, I'll tell you in the next couple slides a little bit about some of our wellness programming and introduce the concept of wellness coaches, which um, is one that we're starting to embrace. Um, we don't have a lot of them on campus yet, but um, we're hoping to have a few more because they, they've been very, very effective for students. So this is just a snapshot of, of one semester of wellness programming that um, we were able to provide to our graduate students through um, our collaboration with the Office of, of Student Wellness. Um, and so far we piloted most of this in those, those small affinity groups that I, I showed you a couple of slides ago. Um, and and you, you can see what the, the list is. I'm not gonna go through it in, in any sort of detail, but the important thing is that it, it's programming that occurs across the semester. Um, we vary the time of day and the day of week that we offer the programming because of course student schedules um, differ and we don't wanna you know, lock a student out completely of, of, of participating in the programming. And we also do some, some pretty robust um, evaluation at the end of the semester to ensure that students are getting what they need out of the programming and to get, to get suggestions on additional programming that we might build in. I mentioned the idea of wellness coaches a few minutes ago. So, so these are people who are not, they're not counselors. They're not, and I, sh I probably shouldn't use that word here. They're, they're not trained clinicians. Um, they really are people who help students to navigate those eight dimensions of wellness that I showed you a couple of slides ago. Um, they help students to talk through the dimensions of wellness, to, to figure out where their dimensions of wellness are, are off, off to kilter. And then they help the students to design strategies to get themselves back on track and to hold themselves accountable for getting on track. And so, um, so again, they provide this individualized guidance and assessment for students. And you know, more and more, we're starting to see them embedded in some of our units here on campus. Um, they tend to be the more well-resourced units. Um, the School of Law has one, for example. The Dental School has one. Um, we have an umbrella program here in the medical school called BBSP. They got a couple of them there. Um, we were actually hoping to have at least one embedded here in the graduate school, and we've run into some financial challenges, so we haven't been able to do that yet. But our goal is to have a suite of these folks embedded across campus so that when a student finds that they're, you know, just not quite feeling it, you know, it's things just aren't working anymore. They got somebody they can go to who can help them to look across their lives, not just their life on campus, but their personal life as well. And again, develop strategies to try and get back on track. So, Suzanne, so, yeah, sorry. Uh, there's a question related to this from Anna. Sure. You want to ask it, Anna, or do you want me to read the question? Sorry, I was chewing a green bean. Um, so my question is whether um, for the wellness programs, how are the people or the students who really need the counseling or the resources available, are you able to get them or figure out how to get those students out there? You know, because some students are really hesitant to ask for help. Great question. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and, and Anna, we find that particularly with, um, with some of our um, African American uh, male students, for example, who don't, don't want to admit that they're asking for help is an admission of, of weakness and admitting weakness means that uh, maybe I don't belong in my graduate program. And that, that's one of our big challenges. It, it's also one of the reasons why we, we would like to have more of these folks embedded here in the graduate school. Our DSS team has worked really hard to build a trusting relationship with our graduate students. And I can't tell you how important that is. Um, Kathy Wood, you'll see a picture of her in, in a few minutes. She's our, our director of DSS. She's almost a den mother for these students. They know her, they trust her, they believe in her and, and they feel comfortable with her. 
And, um, and I believe very strongly that if we can embed someone here who's working with Kathy, students will feel much more comfortable coming to that individual than they would somebody who's embedded in their own school. Um, so okay. your, your point is, is, is very, very well taken and, it, and, it's, and it's an important one for us to consider. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there other questions? I know I'm just motoring on. Okay, well, a couple more wellness things to, to think about. This is another thing that our, our Black graduate students brought up with us. Um, you know, we, we have a counseling center in um, CAPS, um, everybody calls it CAPS, and, um, and our students use it to some extent, but our students were, were quite unhappy that there were no Black counselors there. And so, so when, you're, when you're hiring counselors, or I, or I would offer these wellness coaches, um, think about engaging folks who, who look like your students and or, and or share their lived experience. Um, recognize that our students are in a, um, a more pre um, precarious position when it comes to their careers now than ever before, especially after COVID. So many of our students who were looking to uh, get faculty positions at small liberal arts schools, for example, are watching, watching those schools struggle financially and wondering whether that's the right path. Um, we, we need to be mindful of the connection between mental health and career development and recognize that preparing our students for a diverse array of careers or more particularly for the career path of their choice can go a long way toward alleviating some of their mental health challenges. Also, don't forget to consider the role of personal and family network, um, uh, the family network in the um, support for your, uh, your graduate students, particularly your underrepresented and first generation students. They might not necessarily be able to go home to the Thanksgiving dinner table and describe what they're doing in graduate school and have people nod their heads and say, yeah, I'm glad you didn't just go get a job out of undergraduate. Um, so that you may need to find some strategies to actually pull the families in so they understand as well. That's something we haven't done here yet at, um, at Carolina, but it's a strategy that's worked really well at the undergraduate level in programs like the Meyerhoff program at UMBC. And we do that to some extent with our Chancellor of Science scholars here at, um, at the undergraduate level as well. And then don't discount the power of peer support as well. I, I think that's a lot of what our, um, our IME and MAGS, those, those DSS initiatives are all about. Um, it's bringing students together in a way that they can be with people who have a like uh, or common experience. Um, they can share, they can feel safe and, and, and able to, to um, share their, their concerns and their, their stresses. And, and it makes a big difference for our students. We have a new initiative here at Carolina that's just really getting started. And I, I just wanted to show you a snapshot of it. It's called the Carolina Peer Support Collaborative. And, it, and it's about more than just supporting students. It's actually designed to support students, staff, and faculty. Um, there's a, uh, there's a, a core group that's uh, developing this. And it's led by a guy called Ed Fisher, who's just a tremendous human being. Um, he's basically providing trainings and examples. And then the idea is to arm people to go out and find people who have some sort of shared experience or shared interest. And then those folks come together and they support each other. Um, the basic premise of the Carolina Peer Support Collaborative is that everyone has someone to turn to in coping the challenges confronting us. And so in a time of stress, in a time of, of, of challenge, um, you're going to gravitate toward people who have something in common with you. And, and that's basically what the Carolina Peer Support Collaborative is about. If I'm stressed out, <coughs> for example, if I'm stressed out, um, I love wine. I might want to get together with people who love wine as well and, and share, share my lived experience with them. It's a way for me to relax. It's a way for me to feel like something that I, I do is valued. It's a way for me to feel like I'm included in some way. So again, it's a new um, initiative here at Carolina, one that's just now taking off. And one importantly, I think that um, leverages the same sorts of things that we're building in DSS, where you have folks who have a, a common lived experience, a, a shared identity, who come together to support each other. Suzanne, we have another question from sure. Lisa. Lisa, would you like to ask? Sure. Thank you, Suzanne. This is tremendous and awesome. I'm taking copious notes. Um, I do have a question. <coughs> I'm, Lisa Schreiber, uh, I'm an associate dean uh, in the graduate school for graduate and postdoctoral affairs. And my question really centers around mentors. How are faculty mentors, research mentors, uh, participating in these efforts to recruit and retain underrepresented students and, and importantly, promoting their wellness uh, as well? We know, we know faculty are, are, are certainly having wellness considerations too. I, I feel like we all are. So how are they participating in these efforts? Thank you. 
an excellent question and I appreciate it very much. And mentoring is actually the last part of my talk. So you've, you've anticipated me. And, and the fact is our, our faculty mentors are not spending a lot of time on this right now. And that, that's, that's one of our challenges. Um, part of our challenge, and I imagine it's your challenge too, is how we recognize and reward faculty for being good mentors and incentivize them to, to do more than, um, than, they're, than they're doing now. But, but I'll, I'll get to mentoring in just a couple of seconds. So I, I really do appreciate the question. And in fact, here's my transition. You really, you anticipated me. <laughs> um, so, so these are data that come from a paper that was published in, in Nature Biotechnology, oh, five years ago, maybe. Um, it's the Nathan Vanderford paper that a lot of people quote as the first um, large study showing that uh, graduate students are more likely to have um, anxiety or depression than is the general public. And that's what panel A is, is all about. Um, if you look at individuals who are about the same age as your typical graduate student, um, these two bars, the anxiety and depression bar would be less than 10%. But using the indices that they did in this study, um, anxiety was present in about 41% of graduate students and depression in 39%. And then what you see in panel D over here on the right hand side is, is the part that I want to get to in terms of, of mentorship. So, um, so what you're looking at here is basically a, the results of a questionnaire and the questionnaire asks questions like, does your advisor pro provide mentorship? Do they provide ample support? Do they have a positive emotional impact on you? And if you said yes, the bar is blue. If you said no, the bar is red. And I think what you can see is that um, for the folks, either whether, whether you look at anxiety or look at depression, folks who disagreed with these statements, in other words, said they're, they're meant, their advisors weren't providing this kind of support, are, are tend to have more, much more severe disease. And so the long and the short of it is that mentoring does indeed have an impact on graduate student mental health. And that's probably not surprising given the, uh, the nature of the relationship between graduate students and their mentors. So a couple of resources to think about there. I imagine you're all probably um, familiar with the Center for Improvement of Mentored Experiences and Research, SIMR. Um, in fact, some of you may be trained SIMR facilitators, I, I am. Um, the SIMR method basically works on the, the premise that um, we need to provide our students with um, both um, uh, career development support and also with psychosocial support as they go through graduate school. And the way the SIMR curriculum breaks down is along the lines that you see on this slide. And you can see there's a whole variety of, of, of um, teaching points in SIMR. Each one of these has a teaching piece. And then there are also cases that illustrate why it's so important for a good mentor to, to master these, uh, all these elements of mentoring. I'll note that um, cultivating ethical behavior is here as well. Um, that's something we hear from our graduate students pretty often that they see things happening in the lab and they say, hmm, I don't think that's supposed to happen. And um, when we think about mentoring and modeling the behavior that we hope our students to, will, will um, take on when they become PIs, I don't think we always um, consider just how important it is to model that behavior so that they have a, 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 mentored ex a mentoring experience that doesn't uh, derail their careers. So SIMR so, um, mentor training is, is one approach to think about um, when it comes to um, engaging faculty and, make, and helping them to be more effective mentors. Um, another uh, approach we used back at the University of Georgia, my previous institution was um, we had a mentoring academy. Um, we were very lucky to have a, um, a generous donor who, who underwrote the academy. Um, we had a, an award for, um, for the best uh, graduate student mentor that we gave out every year in, in the graduate school. And basically we invited all the, those awardees to be members of the mentoring academy with the idea that that group of individuals would basically be a safety net, that they would be a source of sort of auxiliary mentoring for graduate students who weren't finding that they were getting good mentoring in their departments or from their, their mentors. Um, and so that, that idea of recognizing and, and rewarding good mentoring becomes an important piece, as we just talked about a few minutes ago. Um, the more challenging thing, thing for us, quite frankly, and I imagine you, you probably face this challenge too, is what do you do with the person who's a lousy mentor? You know, how do you incentivize people who are crappy mentors to, to take SIMR training and to take mentoring seriously? And, and I would also argue that mentoring up, um, which is something that uh, uh, SIMR is just now developing the idea of teaching students to be good mentees and to take full, full advantage of the mentoring they do get is an important piece too. Uh, have, sorry, go ahead, Sasanka. We have a question from Zuja. Zuja? Okay, hey, I'll Suzanne. Hey, how are you? <laughs> so, 
the question is, you know, uh, when problems arise between the student and the mentor, uh, the student may change labs, but this is an absolute setback for the student. And unfortunately in my team, I'm the team, team director for the genetics, genomics and bioinformatics team here. Uh, it occurred that the student al also had uh, other uh, problems, very severe problems. And it is just very difficult to, to have the student in this situation because there are limits for the, for the university to support the student. And we do not want the student to get out without uh, publications because then that will affect uh, his, her uh, future, uh, future uh, performance. So how should we deal with this? Is there any way that you could suggest to, to help us with this? Yeah, that, that, that's a really hard, hard challenge. And, and, and there's, you know, there's another piece that, that too, and, and it is how comfortable students feel about um, leaving uh, abusive mentoring situations. You know, it's not uncommon students stay longer than they should, or they, they never leave, in part because they're afraid they'll, they're, there'll be repercussions if they leave. Um, those repercussions could be anything from, um, from losing their support, as you indicated, to kind of getting a black mark next to their name and not having someone else pick them up so they can get out of graduate school. Um, you know, we're, we're trying really hard to, to address that issue here, and I, I don't have an easy solution for you. Now, we, we've tried to make it clear to students that there are um, um, anonymous ways that they can report when they find themselves in abusive mentoring situations. We encourage them to talk to the ombuds. Um, we encourage them to come talk to us here in the graduate school. But over and over again, I mean, the, the number one complaint I hear from graduate students is about abusive mentoring. But I can count on one hand, I can count on two fingers, basically, the number of times I've had a graduate student come to me and talk about a specific situation. Um, that's the power dynamic issue, I think. And it's one of the reasons why I'll show you on the, this next slide that the National Academy of Sciences did a, um, a report a couple years back on, um, on the science of mentoring. And, um, and they looked at a number of mentor, mentoring models. The, the one we all use is the, is the dyad model, right? One student, one faculty member. Um, the power dynamic here is, is just astronomically huge. The differential is astronomically huge, right? You got the mentor up here, the mentee down there. And you know, the, so the mentee feels like they're, you know, I gotta do what my mentor tells me, even if it just doesn't feel right. What the National Academy of Sciences is arguing is that engaging students in these more complex mentoring relationships where they're in at least a triad and maybe even something that looks more like a group or a network disperses that power differential. So now the student feels more empowered. And because they feel more empowered, well, number one, they have more than one mentor to go to if one of them turns out to be a lousy mentor. But number two, the power differential is distributed. So now they feel more empowered, more like they have a, a say in all of it. And so maybe this is an approach that we can all start thinking about moving forward. But you know, this, this is a problem. And it's a problem that, um, like I say, the NAS has recognized and um, is charging at least the National Science Foundation with thinking very carefully about um, when it, start, when it uh, makes its awards. Suzanne, uh, we have a question from a student that uh, relates specifically to this. Bree, do you want to ask it? Sure. Um, my question is, how would you advise students to be vocal about these issues? And a very specific issue is a lack of re faculty representation. And so, and when I mean vocal, I mean to actually invoke change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it's hard. And, and, and you know, I, I, again, I wish I had a, a, a simple answer for you. And it's probably going gonna, gonna to vary depending on your, on your institution. Here, um, the graduate students, they've had an audience with them, um, with the chancellor, the provost and I, and they, they express those concerns. And, and um, we take those concerns very, very seriously. Um, we were able to do that here in part because um, we have a chancellor right now who, um, whose number one goal, the legacy he wants to leave at this institution is to um, make it more diverse, equitable, equitable and inclusive. And so they, they knew there was a listening ear but not, um, not every student has that, that, um, that, that lucky opportunity. And so I'd argue start, maybe start by talking to, your, um, to the graduate school um, and um, from there get their advice in terms of how you might engage university leadership to have those conversations. 
um, you know, you, you raise a, a really important point. And unless we retain um, underrepresented students in, uh, in our disciplines, um, we are never going to diversify the faculty. And, you know, we've been talking about faculty diversi diversification since I was a graduate student, um, when it was even less diverse than it is now. You, you raise a really, really good point. Yeah. And I think that's interesting that, you know, it's, we should keep the students and then that will attract the faculty. But really as a student um, and still as a student, I see it as the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, me being a black female, I've always wanted to see black females yeah. being my professor. I only got that opportunity literally once, but, um, and that was when, you know, I was at a HBCU and still that was pretty low in representation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, you know, has anyone thought about reversing that? You know, let's bring the faculty and then the students shall come. That, yeah, you know. I, and that, that's exactly exactly the point. Um, and that, that's what our students were telling us. They, they said, when we, you know, if, if you want to diversify your student population, students are smart. They look at the website. Um, they know who's, who's on your faculty and they know who's not on your faculty. Um, and um, and your, your point is your point is well taken. And um, the the argument is one that um, that I, I think some some institutions appreciate, and um, and and some of our institutions are starting to take strat to take uh, steps in that direction. But I would only point out that it's not just just as with students, it's not just about recruiting. It's also about about retaining um, faculty of color, and um, and that's a challenging piece as well because again, so many of our faculty of color. Have additional burdens on faculty that our majority faculty don't, and so we have to make sure that our faculty of color are rep are recognized for those additional burdens, and um, and given the opportunity to be just as successful as our um, majority faculty. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to um, uh, you know um, step in. Um, you know, I, I I've been at UAB School of Medicine for about eighteen months now, and um, I'm I'm also um, a member of the. Um, um, uh, Black African American Faculty Association, and this association has just recently um, been formed, and um, we are start, you know, start, are start, starting to um, reach out to um, other uh, uh, other associations on campus. But um, I think the um, idea of representation um, is extremely important. Um, I've worked in other organizations where, I mean, UAB. Um, I have to admit, it has a, a very special place in my heart because. Uh, when we, the African American uh, Faculty Association was formed, the first meeting, there was actually 70 uh, faculty members there. And I've, I was very impressed by this because um, I came from another organization where if something like that was formed, uh, there, would, there would be less than five or six um, faculty members there. So I just want to say that, you know, UAB School of Medicine is doing, um, you know, um, quite a bit uh, and um, trying to reach out and, and also that representation, representation um, it's very important. I've been in the field for 25, 25 years, and um, I'm a faculty uh, member. And I do, I, I do, I do feel um, very encouraged by what UAB Medical uh, Medical School is doing um, in terms of um, bringing um, faculty in and and, and um, uh, uh, so that we can um, represent and and mm -hmm. help students. And when students look up and think, "Oh, there's a black associate professor over there, Yvonne Edwards, um, that's very encouraging. Um, and, you know, so it's very nice that we're having uh, these conversations and these uh, types of seminars. And the association that's formed um, as well is actually reaching out. And I, I feel that these uh, conversations, um, you know, are, are, are doing um, a lot for diversity and, and a lot for the minorities. So I'm really pleased about that. Um, it's very, it's, 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 you know, I just wanted to, uh, um, you know, just add those contributions. That's terrific. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so I'm just going to leave you with some some mentoring resources that may be helpful. Um, you know, the Simmer, for example. There's a link here to Simmer. Um, there's a link here to um, some of the new work that's being done in terms of culturally aware mentoring. Um, Rick Mc, Rick McGee at Northwestern does a, a wonderful. Um, training session on cult on culturally aware mentoring, and um, I highly recommend his sessions if um, if you um, want to engage him. And then there's some mentoring guides and mentoring compacts that may be helpful as well. And you know, I'll just remind you that that all the work that we've we've done in in the areas I've touched on today, it's I you know I speak of it as the graduate school, but we can't do it without the help of um, of colleagues around campus. And in particular, the the key partnerships we've formed are shown on this slide. 
Um, we're, we're not an island. Um, we are very much integrated into the fabric of, um, of our university. And, um, and we rely on, on our, our partners to help to, to fill the gaps and to, to do the things that we need to do. So last but not least, I, I wanna thank um, the Diversity and Student Success Team, DSS. Um, that's a picture of them on the right-hand side. Um, this is Kathy Wood right here in the middle. Um, notice she, that she is not a member of an underrepresented group, but, but again, she has built um, a relationship of trust and mutual respect with our underrepresented graduate students in a way that she really does bring the, um, she brings it. She's, uh, she's the glue that holds our programs together. Um, the other thing I'll point out in the back here that looks like a church, and it is a, um, a renovated church. It's where our graduate student center is located. And so we have some defined space for graduate students too. And that's where we hold all of our programming for our, our underrepresented students. It's, it's effectively a home away from home, so to speak, for our students. And so with that, I'll just thank you. Um, I think I've left just a couple of, of minutes for questions, but I'm happy to, to um, answer questions and happy for more dialogue. Um, if you wanna reach out to me at my email address here on the slide. And, and, and again, I, I'll send these slides to you. Thank you, Suzanne, for a great presentation. We had one of the largest audiences uh, for one of these talks, CDIP talks, and uh, the, the chat has really blown up and I'm hoping there's a way to save it and send it to you. And I want to remind everyone that the, the talk has been recorded and the slides are made available to you from her if you ask her. So we have a couple more minutes if anybody has a question. I have a, a, just a question as a chair who's you know, interested in increasing diversity in the department. You know, we've done a great job of, of female representation. We're probably what, 55, 60% female in CDIP. But out of the last search, for example, that we did, we had 120 applicants, one black applicant. And so, I mean, that's on me not reaching out to find the applicants, but it, that is the huge challenge we're facing to address this issue. And I don't know how to, to, to solve it. Yeah, I, I don't either. I, I mean, I'd be a millionaire if I did. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it starts a, a little bit earlier and, and that's what the NSF AGEP um, awards are about. You know, they're about capturing, capturing, engaging students when they're still in graduate school and getting them thinking about the professoriate and then ultimately following them um, to see if they make it into the professoriate. I, I think another big part of it, honestly, is our students are just tired, you know? Um, particularly our underrepresented students, they, um, they go through academia, they, they um, find themselves in these toxic learning environments. And, um, and then the, you ask the question, do you wanna be a faculty member? No, why would I wanna, I just wanna get my degree and get away from this crazy place. Um, so I, I so, see that amongst our, a lot of our students in general. Yeah, I think we have to be really mindful of that. Uh, we just got a, a grant award from the, um, the Council of Graduate Schools to do what I think is going to be some really neat work. And it's, it's why I have to hop off in a couple of minutes to, um, for a meeting. Um, we're going to be working with a, a few departments. It's a pilot grant to help them take a really critical look at their, um, their culture, their local culture within the department, and then start, develop some start developing some strategies that they can use to address issues of equity and inclusion in their departments with the idea that, you know, we can do any, everything we want in the graduate school, you know, to, to give these students coping skills and, you know, give them a sense of community. But if we send them out to departments where they don't feel valued, where they feel like they're outsiders, um, you know, all our efforts go to naught. And so, you know, that but we're trying to get out in the departments now too, to do some some work on the local level that may help our students as well. But you, I mean, your, your point is, is well taken. I, I, you know, I can count on one hand, one hand um, among my, colleagues in graduate school who were underrepresented, um, the number who went into academia and stayed there. Most of them didn't do it. They said, I'm done. I think we need to 